Okay, so we're live here. Uh, welcome to everyone in person and online. And so I'm excited about this message today. I, I, I really believe it's the, what the Lord would have me to speak and to say today. And I uh, just kind of want to give a little introduction to this message. The, this message today is called The Day of His Power. And that, that phrase is taken from Psalms 110, verse 3. But I just want to give a little bit of background to share, share with you why I'm sharing this message today is every time I speak, I try my best, and I don't always do it well, but I try my best to only speak what the Holy Spirit is leading me to say. I want to make sure that I'm not just saying a good message, I'm saying what God is, is saying to us. I don't always do that perfect. In fact, I was this week I was thinking, okay, it's 4th of July. I want to come up with something easy so I don't have to prepare very much. Honestly, I was. And uh, I was thinking, okay, I could do an encouraging message about Isaiah 33, 6, about God being the stability of your times and to encourage people. But um, I, I, was, I was really debating on Monday um, about what to speak about and in fact, Tazia had sent to our forerunner group a teaching I did on the 144,000 about six years ago, and my views have changed slightly since then. I was thinking, oh man, I probably need to redo that message and correct some things that I taught wrongly. So I was on Monday, Angie and I were on a walk, and I was thinking, okay, um, will you pray for me because I my my. I have two competing things I feel like I need to talk about. One, on the one hand, I feel like I need to talk about God's army in the day of his power and explain the 144,000. On the other hand, it was more my 4th of July soul rising up saying, okay, I don't really want to put the effort in that it's going to take to do that message. So maybe I'll just do a real simple message that I already had. <clears throat> but would you pray for me? Would you pray that the Lord would show me? And I was really kind of just wrestling through that all week. Just, okay, Lord, I can't get clarity about exactly what you want me to do. I felt like, you know, if I had to be honest in my spirit, I felt like the Lord was saying, teach about his, his army in the day of his power and explain the 144,000. But in my soul, I was like, I don't want to put the effort into it. That's a lot of work. I want to just coast into the holiday. It's 4th of July holiday weekend and all that. So that was leaning really heavily towards doing the encouraging message of Isaiah 33, 6, God's for you, he's not against you, he loves you, all that. And anyway, I was in prayer on Friday morning and really just praying through, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to speak? What do you want me to say? And I went, I went to uh, check my email and as I was praying, a friend of mine was up late in California and he said, I really felt prompted by the Lord to give you a scripture from Joel chapter 2, which Joel chapter 2 describes the army of the Lord in the last days, the end time army of the Lord in the last days. And he said, when I, when I got that word for you, um, I felt, when I looked at my phone and my phone said it was 144 and I felt like God is saying the 144,000. Okay. I mean, not, you cannot, this is what's so incredible about the prophetic, you cannot make that up. This is, that, that, I, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff about the prophetic right now where it's gotten out of hand and it's just abusive and stuff like that. But this is the beauty of the real, genuine prophetic. If you think about, just think about this for a second, the way God sovereignly confirmed this, this incredible, I mean, these are very odd topics. I mean, in, in fact, part of me was like, okay, one of the reasons I don't want to talk about the 144,000 is because a lot of people would be like, I don't care about the 144,000. I'm sure you did not wake up today going, I want to know, okay, I'm really curious, what does 144,000 mean? I mean, you're just trying to get here on time. But you, you think about that, and I was thinking, God, who was even going to care about that? that? That was part of my wrestling with it. And the fact that that this obscure topic, he emails me the very two things God was putting on my heart, the, the army, the Lord's army in the last days, the day of his power, and the 144,000. And he confirms that at the very moment I'm praying what to speak about for Sunday. It was like, wow, that is, that is incredible. You, you simply cannot make that up. 
It's divine confirmation. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So I really do believe that the Lord is, is having me to, uh, to speak that. Um, the, the other reason I felt led to, to speak about this right now is I know, I know a good number of us are going to the conference with Terry and Josiah Bennett and Chris Reed, uh, the time of the eternal gospel. And, you know, I, I have a, a huge expectation for what God's going to do in this conference. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll explain that later. But I, I just was thinking, okay, you know, I think it would be very helpful to lay out. And I think, you know, Terry's mentioned he's going to be speaking out of Revelation 14. And that passage mentions 144,000. I think it would be very helpful for me to explain my view on that and what I believe about that. So that's kind of where I was debating on. And so anyway, the Lord just, just supernaturally, in a way that you cannot make up, dramatically confirmed that this is indeed the way that I am to go. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to start with reading the scripture that, was, that my friend gave me. It's Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 that uh, Joel speaks about the day of the Lord. It's, we are not yet living in the day of the Lord. We're, it seems as if we're moving faster and faster into that day. But Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, the, Joel the prophet says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. And that's talking about, I believe that's talking about the second coming time frame at the end of the age. The day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Verse 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, this is where I'm, this is where I'm getting to. So there is a great and a mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. In other words, what, now I'm going to explain what I believe that means in this message, but in other words, what we are living in, the, the time frame we are living in, what God is about to do would blow your mind. It is the, you know, a lot of people like when we talk about the end times, there's all this fear and all this dread and all this anxiety about, oh God, I don't want to have to live through all that. But I want to, re I want to reframe that and say, no, actually, this is the greatest moment to be alive if you're in Christ. It's not going to be necessarily comfortable and easy. It's not going to be, you know, the, the American lifestyle that we've enjoyed may change, well, will change uh, dramatically. But it is an incredible time to be alive. There has never been any time like it. The times we're moving into, there's never been anything like it. There will never again be anything like it. And I think that's in the context before the Lord returns. Because after the Lord returns, it'll be dramatically different. It'll be way better than this. But God is raising up an army in the day of his power that is going to confront darkness and wickedness and lead to the greatest move of God in history with the greatest authority in history, with the greatest power in history to make the bride ready before the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's something we've never seen. A great and a mighty people. It, it, it has been, not been seen before in history, but it's an army God is assembling as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of where, where you know, the, the scripture verse that we launched from, but um, I just want us to think about this because we get so busy in our everyday lives that it's so easy not to realize we are in fact living in the end times. We are in fact living in the end times. We are living in the end times. And a lot of times just need to wake up and realize, no, we actually, this is actually for real. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. I can't predict if it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. I don't know. But clearly the signs are pointing to the day when he would return. Just think about some of these things for a minute. Israel becoming a nation in 1948. So many biblical prophecies hinged on Israel being a nation. 
Jerusalem being captured by the Jews in 1967. After almost 2,000 years of desolation, Jerusalem captured by the Jews. Again, so many Old Testament prophecies are Jerusalem-centric. Think about this, the rise of technology and AI and digital currency and biometric identification, all of that fits into the end time scenario and all of that is here right now, right now. The push for globalism by the UN, the World Economic Forum, the European Union and other agencies, there is clearly a major push right now coming out of Europe to establish a world government and many of the policies our own government are, are, are enacting are coming from that influence because many of the world's elite today want global government. And, and, and if you feel like, okay, what's going on in this nation is because there is a push going on from those with incredible amounts of money, incredible amounts of power and influence who want global government. There is a push for global government like never before in history, like never before in history, there is a push for global government, and we are in a battle for that right now, and you, you, most of you know that. The decline of America as the world's superpower. I mean, are we not witnessing that right now? I mean, just if you saw the debate, I mean, it was like, okay, you're telling me this guy is our president? I mean, you know, thankfully he got a spray tan because now he can really be a better president. <laughs> and anyway, if you know what I'm talking about. But... We are living in the day of, Amer of the decline of America as the world's superpower. We're hearing of wars and rumors of wars, just like Jesus said. The pandemic in 2020, COVID, that was definitely, I believe, a birth pain of the end times. You look around, you see the moral decline, the lawlessness, the apostasy, the falling away. It's definitely, and I mentioned a few weeks ago that, that uh, over the last 25 years, there's, I think, four, I forget the exact quote, 40 million, I forget, it was, it was a, I can't remember off the top of my head. But the massive number of people that have, fall, have now are unchurched have fallen away. Widespread deception through false prophets and false teachers. We're seeing that like never before. In fact, one of the first warnings Jesus gave is about the end times is see to it that you are not deceived because many will come in my name. Many are going to come. They're not going to come saying, hey, I am Jesus Christ. They're not going to say, I am Jesus Christ. They're going to come in the name of Jesus Christ saying that he's Christ. They're going to, in other words, be believers and they're going to deceive many people. We're seeing that right now. The, the, all this, you know, everyone listen, you got to be careful what you listen to out there on YouTube because so many people are, are spouting out deception and lies and there's so much uh, the rise of false prophets and false teachers. It's clearly here. Um, the plans to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and the, the discovery of the red heifer. Those are all like all these things are coming together. The dramatic increase in anti-Semitism. We're seeing that in college campuses. We're seeing that spread throughout all the earth. The, the formation of alliances that will attack Israel in the last days exactly as the prophets have said. So I say all that stuff not to scare you but to prepare you to, and to wake you to realize we are in fact living in that day. We are living in what the prophets have prophesied for, uh, for many, many years ago. We are living in that day. And it's so important that that trumpet is blown, the trump, blow the trumpet in Zion so that we can wake up and we can see, okay, yes, these are the days we are in fact living in. Now, what, what I, this message today I hopefully is going to be like an encouragement to you because a lot of times if you have the wrong paradigm of the end times, the end times sound very hopeless, very discouraging, and almost like we're just going to hide around and hide out in the corner and, and hopefully the Antichrist won't get us and we're going to wait to be raptured out of here from Jesus. And, and I think the scriptures, and hopefully this will make more sense, paint a different picture. No, God is raising up an army in the earth. God is raising up an apostolic and prophetic army with the greatest authority and the greatest power the world has ever seen. And we're being, I believe that this army is, is, is what the end time church will be like, an Elijah army that will have great authority and great power. And just like 
Moses and just like Elijah confronted Pharaoh and confronted Ahab, this army will confront darkness and challenge uh, evil, wicked leaders and evil people and call them to repentance. And then through their ministry, it talks about in Revelation 7 that there was a, a number too great to count of all the nations coming and they make their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. There is coming the greatest move of God in history and you are born for such a time as this. You are born for this very hour. Now, just to, just to give a little, uh, I want to give a little bit of background to this message so you can understand um, where I'm coming from. Is I believe in a, there's different eschatological views of the end times, different end time views that are out there. And this view that I'm presenting is, is coming from a, what, the, what scholars call historic premillennialism. Historic premillennialism. Okay? So what that basically means is that, is that, is that Jesus is not, when Jesus is going to return before his literal 1,000 year reign. It means that the, the rapture will take place at his second coming, not a pre-trib rapture. And it also means the church will be on the earth during the great tribulation for the last three and a half years. Now, a lot of people call it historic because uh, many of the church fathers uh, taught this eschatological view. This is the view that many church fathers taught. In fact, uh, what is commonly known as the pre-tribulation rapture uh, dispensational, uh, dis dispensational view, that didn't come around until the 19th century. And so, so many, many scholars call this view the historic premillennial view because it's rooted in church history. So just a little uh, background there. Okay, the other thing I want to say is when you come to the book of Revelation, it's very important. You can get some really weird, wacky views of the book of Revelation. If you don't view the book of Revelation as, a, as future oriented, a futurist, we believe that, that most of the prophecies from, or mainly all of the prophecies from about Revelation 4 or Revelation 5 onward are future. In other words, they, had, they were not fulfilled in 70 AD, which uh, people who believe in preterism uh, teach. I believe that's an absolute uh, doctrine of devils. I believe it's so false. The book of Revelation wasn't even written until 95 AD. And so the, the book of Revelation is a future oriented book. So in other words, these, what the book of Revelation talks about is future. Not, it has not come to pass yet. And, they, and in other words, the other, the other thing I want to say about the interp interpreting the book of Revelation is what scholars call the historical grammatical interpretation. And that's a lot of fancy words just to mainly say, we, we, if we're going to interpret the book of Revelation, we have got to get into the mind of the first century audience. That, like when, when, the, when that message was given to the first century audience, what was that audience, what did they think that, that Jesus was saying to them? Because that was who this book was originally written to. We want to understand, okay, Lord, his, historically, what is it you were speaking to this audience? Okay, does that make sense? Um, the default method of interpretation should be literal. There, the, some scholars have said, okay, when the text makes sense, seek no other sense. When the text makes sense, seek no other sense. In other words, the default way we should read the scriptures is literally. In other words, what it says what it means and means what it says. But in, the, in a book like the book of Revelation, though we interpret it literally, there are definitely times when you come to the book of Revelation where you've got to realize, okay, this is using metaphorical language. Like, for example, Revelation 13 talks about a beast who's going to arise out of the earth and he's going to take dominion over the earth. I mean, do we really think an animal, if you interpret it literally, do we really think an animal is going to rise up and take dominion over all the earth. Now, I know AI has a lot of power, but I, I don't believe that's what Revelation was saying. In other words, it's using metaphorical language to say this beast is a reference to Daniel chapter 7, alluding to a future literal person called the Antichrist who will rise up and is a metaphor used, and we got to use that in our interpretation. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Another example is is in Revelation chapter 20 when, the, uh, when it talks about after the millennial kingdom, after the thousand year reign of Christ, 
that Satan is released from the bottomless pit. He's released from prison. And he goes out and he gathers from the four corners of the earth all the nations. And they come and attack Jerusalem. And, and in that passage, it's called Gog and Magog. Okay, well, that's a reference to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's no way that prophecy is, is uh, going to take place after the millennial kingdom. There's simply no way. The context, I mean, first of all, I won't get into all the details, but first of all, Ezekiel 38 and 39 only revolves around about eight to ten nations. Ezekiel, or Revelation chapter 20, is talking about the, the nations from all the four corners of the earth. So what the book of Revelation there is doing is using this war that's going to come after the millennial kingdom and saying, using a metaphorical language, Gog and Magog, to say is going to be like what happens in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's not saying it's the same thing. It's saying it's going to be like that. Okay, does that make sense? So just again, remember this, especially in the book of Revelation. If you don't follow this principle in the book of Revelation, you get weird, weird, weird teachings. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. But again, Revelation is written in such a way that if we were to follow that all the way, then we would literally think there's a, a literal animal, a lamb, on the throne of God. Okay, Clearly, there's not a literal lamb on the throne of God. It's Jesus who is the lamb because of his atoning sacrifice. So you, there is this you, the need to understand the use of metaphorical language carefully and cautiously in the book of Revelation. Not everything should be interpreted metaphorically. There, when, when Jesus says seven churches, there's seven literal churches. When Jesus says the seven spirits of God, there are seven literal spirits, or the seven attributes of the spirit of God. And so you, you've got to just, you know, that's why it's so important, this book. That's why a lot of people just want to stay away from this book because they're like, okay, this is confusing. How do you know when to use metaphorical? How do you know when to use literal? Yeah, I mean, it, it's that's why a lot of people, that's why there's so many different teachings on the book of Revelation. A lot of people just go, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. That's too, that's too complicated. And we can't do that. We can't do that. We are living in the days when this book is coming to pass. We can't just go, okay, that's too complicated. I don't understand. We've got to have this book. The Lord is going to show his people who are really seeking him, okay, this is what this means. This is what, this, this is what I intended for this to mean. Okay, so that, those things in mind, make sense? Okay, it's a lot to mouthful here, but what I want to do in this message is, the, I, want to, I want to tell just real quick the what, the when, and the why of this message, just real quick. What this message is, what I want to do is I want to show very clearly the Lord is preparing an overcoming spiritual army of apostolic and prophetic witnesses who will initiate Christ's return on the earth in the day of God's power. Okay, let me say that again. <clears throat> the Lord is preparing an overcoming spiritual army. Okay, it's spiritual. I just want to make sure in this day and age of YouTube and so on, you're talking about an army with weapons? No, it's not physical weapons of war. It's spiritual, it's spiritual power <laughs> and authority. The Lord is preparing an overcoming spiritual army of apostolic and prophetic witnesses who will initiate Christ's return on the earth in the day of God's power. Okay, when will this take place? Okay, this army will be fully commissioned and sent out to accomplish its mission during the last three and a half years of the age. Okay, so we're talking about... We don't know exactly how long that's going to be. Well, we're talking about the last three and a half years of the age. God is going to have a, a powerful army of apostolic prophetic witnesses who are, going to be, who are going to then equip the body of Christ to be the army God's called them to be. Okay? So the question is, why talk about this subject? Why talk about this subject? I mean, if it's like so far out there, it doesn't even make sense. Well, some people think this army is just going to magically appear out of thin air during the Great Tribulation. Some people think like God sovereignly in one split second is going to just all of a sudden this army is going to appear and they're equipped and they're ready and they're trained of messengers and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors and, you know, 
just ordinary businessmen, I don't mean ordinary in a derogatory way, but not in, in full-time ministry or not in a five-fold ministry capacity, uh, just all of a sudden it's going to appear out of nowhere and they're going to be anointed. And that's not the case. If you think this, we got to think about this in a practical way. If we're living in the end times, and if there is indeed, and I'm going to show you why I believe that, indeed an army being raised up for those, those, that last, those last days before the Lord returns, there is a great need for the army to be prepared. There's a great need for the army to be equipped. There's a great need for the army to be trained and anointed and made ready and, and internally become like Christ. This is a, an army that requires holiness. This is an army that where the self-life must go to the cross and die. This is an army that, that absolutely requires sanctification and holiness and purity. That doesn't just happen in like three months. That happens over many years. And we've got to start talking about this army that God's raising up because it's not just going to magically appear. Make sense why I'm talking about that? We have a role to play. This church has a role to play. Life School has a role to play. In fact, what Life School is doing in the nations is, is, is helping to train and equip this army of messengers and master builders, apostles and prophets to be this part of this John the Baptist vessel, God's raising up, who will prepare the way for the Lord's return and prepare the bride for Jesus Christ. Okay, are you with me? I encourage you, by the way, to read the notes that are going to be associated with this message because there is so much you need to chew on. I'm giving you things, of, I'm giving you things I believe the Lord has shown me over many, many years of thinking and chewing and meditating. If you just hear this from a message, it's just going to go right over your head. You might get a little bit, but you really need to dig in. You really need to chew. You need to be like, okay, when you go to a restaurant, do you want to just read the menu or do you want to eat? And if you just hear this message, you're just hearing the menu read. You've got to dig in and eat because we've got to understand these things. Okay, so let me talk about now I want to hopefully change a little bit of our thinking about when does the reign of Christ begin? When does the reign of Christ begin? Again, I believe that the fullness of his reign is when, during the millennial kingdom. Um, I believe that his reign has not been initiated yet. But I want to ask the question, when does the reign of Jesus Christ begin? And to answer that question, let's, let's look very carefully at Revelation 11 verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud... Okay, just let me just say this before I get in here. The seventh trumpet judgment by the seventh angel takes place, takes place a few months, a few months or so before the Lord actually comes back. So this is at the very end of the last three and a half year period. So... Carefully hear this. Then the angels sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Because the judgments of the day of the Lord have decimated the earth, and God's defeating his enemies, and now his reign is, or his kingdom is about to come, or his kingdom is in the process of coming, he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were. Now notice this. Because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now, if you notice this very carefully, the tense, I'm not just a little technical here, but just bear with me. The Greek tense of the verbs, you have taken and you have begun to reign, point to a specific moment in time when God decisively began his reign, this was indicating a completed action with ongoing results. In other words, by the time we get to the seventh trumpet, God's reign has already begun, his great power has already been released, and his reign has already been initiated. Does that make sense? You're all looking at me like, what are you talking about? This is part of the reason why I needed a prophetic word to share this, because I knew I'd get like deer in the headlight looks like, what are you talking about? <laughs> But what this is saying here is that the reign of the Lord doesn't happen at the seventh trumpet. 
it doesn't or doesn't isn't initiated at the seventh trumpet. It isn't even initiated when the Lord comes back. The reign of the Lord is initiated when he takes his great power and begins to reign. So there is a beginning of his reign that happens before he actually comes back on the earth and it's initiated with what? Power. Power. You see that? Okay. When exactly does the reign of Christ begin? I, be, I believe his reign in, is initiated in Revelation 12, verse 10. So, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation 12, verse 10. Now the salvation and the power, notice that, the power, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. When, did, when does Revelation 12:10 take, take, take place? It takes place right prior to the beginning of the Great Tribulation, right prior to the beginning of the last three and a half years of the age. So it's at that time the power and the kingdom and the authority and the salvation of God has come. Okay? Right before he comes back. And again, if you look at the, the Greek tense of this verb come, it's in the eros tense, which indicates a completed action or event in the past that has ongoing effects. So in other words, it, it, what, what, I, what I believe that this is saying is that Revelation 12.10 marks a new era, era a new uh, time, a new season in the Lord's unworking of his prophetic plans called the day of power, the day of authority, the day of his kingdom coming. And so what we, it almost seems like a contradiction because the Antichrist is given dominion over all the earth or over much of the earth. And yet here, what we're saying, no, the kingdom of God is come, he has, has come and his power and his authority have come, okay? And so what God does is he, his power and authority has come, but he's, he's ruling, like it says in Psalms 110, he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. His reign is initiated in the midst of his enemies, and God's going to use his army to confront this evil regime and this, these people and who are caught up in that regime and call them to repentance, call them to salvation, call them to make themselves ready as the bride for Jesus Christ. Okay, are you with me on that? The casting down of the dragon and his angels from the second heaven is the first act of the day of his power. So the day of his power comes... The day of his authority comes and the first action that takes place now that his power has come, now that his authority has come, is the dragon and his angels are cast down from the second heaven to the earth. And then that's when the Antichrist changes and breaks the covenant he's made and becomes who, he, who, he, who the scriptures, the evil wicked man he is, possessed by Satan, you see in Revelation 13 for the last three and a half years. But the thing I want to point out here is the day of his power comes and the first act that takes place is Satan is cast down and his angels from the second heaven because God's power has come. The day of, in Psalms 110.3, the day of his power has commenced. The day of his power has arrived. A new time, a new season that will lead into the millennial kingdom has arrived with great power and great authority. Okay, so I want to show a chart here just to show, help, hopefully this helps you visualize what I just was talking about, is you see here, there, there's two sections, three and a half years, that's coming from Daniel's 70 week prophecy, that the the Seven-year period begins when the, the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel that resumes temple sacrifices and people around the world are saying peace and safety. Now, right here, right before the, mid, the midpoint of the tribulation, right prior to that, the beginning of the great tribulation, 
I believe this is when Revelation 12.10 takes place. The day of God's power comes and the reign of Christ is initiated. And then you see here at the very end, the seven trumpet judgment. That's when that trumpet judgment was pronounced that was showing us his reign has already begun and his reign began when he took his great power in the day of God's power, Revelation 12.10, and began to reign. Okay, is this making sense? I feel like, uh, yeah, <clears throat> hopefully this makes sense. Again, I want to encourage you to read these notes to, to hopefully make sense of this. Okay, now let's talk about, uh, let's turn to Psalms 110. Psalms 110 is a very, very important prophecy. Psalms 110 is hugely important. I, I believe not enough people talk about Psalms 110. But Psalms 110 is showing us the commencing or the initiation of the reign of the Messiah that eventually becomes his 1,000 year reign on the earth. And Psalm 110 is a psalm of David that, the, that David writes is a prophetic psalm. It's a psalm that I believe is, begins to be fulfilled in Revelation 12.10. And the Lord says to my Lord, in other words, the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a, full a footstool for your feet. Now, what that basically means, some people have misinterpreted this to say, okay, Jesus has got to stay in heaven until his enemies are defeated by the church on the earth. And they would even say that means the Antichrist and the false prophet. That is, that's absolutely nonsense because Jesus is the one who defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet. Jesus does, not his church. So when, when, the, when the Lord says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, what he's saying here, what this really means is, it means you must reign. Jesus, you must reign until your enemies become a footstool for your feet. That's what it means. It doesn't mean he's going to stay in heaven until they become his footstool. That means he must reign until his enemies become a footstool for his feet. And we find in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul quotes this verse and shows us the very last enemy is death that the Lord will reign on the earth until death is defeated in the final resurrection after his 1,000 year reign. That's talked about in Revelation chapter 20. Okay. So what this prophetic psalm is describing here, and then he says in verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. In other words, the reign of Jesus Christ is initiated while his enemies have authority, dominion, power, and influence in the earth. Does that make sense? It's in the midst of God's enemies that the Messiah begins to his reign, which is not when he returns, but it's three and a half years prior to that. Okay, now let's look at verse 3. This is where I'm getting to in this message. In verse 3, is Psalm 110.3 says, Your people... Now, remember the context is talking about when the reign of the Messiah begins in the midst of his enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. That word volunteer freely means there will be a free will offering in the day of your power. Okay, when did I just show you the, the power, the day of power begins? Revelation 12.10, right before the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The day of God's power begins at that point, fulfilling Psalms 110, verse 3. Now, what's very interesting is if you look at this word power in the Hebrew, this, this word power can be translated army. In fact, the interpretation I prefer, or the translation I prefer, is that your people will volunteer freely in the day of your powerful army. In the day of God's powerful army that is going to come to initiate the reign of Christ on the earth like John the Baptist who prepared the way for the first coming of the Messiah. God is going to have a many-membered John the Baptist company that's going to prepare the way for the second coming of the Messiah. You think about this. 
John the Baptist, only one messenger was needed in the first coming of Jesus because Jesus only came to Judah. Well, in his second coming, he's coming to all the nations. All the nations of the earth are going to see the, his power and great glory. And God's going to have to have many, many messengers, apostles and prophets, equipped like John the Baptist to prepare the way because he's coming not just to, not just to the nation, to the nation of Israel. Yes, he's coming there, but he's coming. He's going to, you're going to see him throughout the entire earth in power and great glory. So God needs many messengers to prepare the way like John the Baptist for that time. So Psalm 110.3 says, Your people will volunteer freely. They will be free will offerings in the day of your power, in the day of your army of power. In the day of your army of power, they will volunteer freely. In holy array, that tells us that, they will have, that holiness is vital for this army. God right now is judging his house. God right now is bringing exposure to his house. God is exposing all of the corruption, not even all of it. He's beginning to expose it. And I don't think we've even seen the half of it yet. There's so much more to come. There's so much more to come. But God is beginning to bring judgment to his house because God wants a holy people, a sanctified people, a people of purity and holiness who walk in the fear of the Lord, who walk and live by the life of Christ. So this army God is raising up, we can't, will not have mixed motives. They will not have selfish ambition. They will not, we're trying to be building their own kingdoms. They will not be in it for themselves and their influence and how many likes they can get on their uh, videos or uh, posts. It's not about any of that. It's about the lamb. It's about God having what he wants. And, and, and this, this psalm says they will be free will offerings. They will be bond servants. They will be, Lord, we're, we're going to follow the Lamb wherever you go. And it, the holiness is required. And, and Psalm 110 says, In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. So Psalm, Psalm 110 is clearly, clearly talking about the day of God's wrath. In fact, it says so. In verse 5, the day of his wrath. So what we see here, if, if, let me just read um, Psalm 110, verse 5, just to show you here. This, this is not a long psalm at all. Psalm 110, verse 5, tells us clearly the context of when this prophecy will be fulfilled. Let me turn there, hold on. Psalm 10, verse 5, said, The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. When is that? That is the great and the terrible day of the Lord. The great and the terrible day of the Lord. So in other words, Psalms 110 is telling us the reign of the, of the Messiah will be initiated when his enemies have influence, power, and dominion. And he, his reign will be extended in the midst of that time when his enemies have influ, has influence and he, he rules in the midst of his enemies. It's in the day of his wrath. And he, his, his, his reign is initiated, what? Through an army of great power and holiness. That's what God is wanting to raise up in this hour. We're not there yet, but the preparation for this has to begin. It takes many years to get ready. It takes many years to be equipped and trained and stuff like that. So we have to get ready for this. Okay. Does this make sense so far? Okay. Hopefully it makes sense. So now I want to talk about the 144,000 in Revelation 7, 1 through 8, and also Revelation 14, 1 through 5. And I want to describe to you kind of my journey in this process. It almost seems like, well, that's just a weird, I mean, 144,000 is just weird. It's associated, uh, sadly, with the Jehovah's Witnesses who think they're the fulfillment of this prophecy. And so... You know, it's, it's, you know, it's just a little bit strange to us, and we think, okay, that's just really not practical. And it's like, no, this is a huge, what I'm about to show you is huge to the book of Revelation, to understanding the book of Revelation. I remember 
uh, for many years, I believe that Revelation 7, 1 through 8, was talking about uh, 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Literally, that's what it meant. There would be, God would supernaturally mark out 12,000 from Benjamin, 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Dan, 12,000 from Reuben, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that it would basically just be about, it's really a prophecy related to Israel. And so I, I believe that for many years, and I even taught that in uh, the teaching from six years ago, that there was, because I, what I saw was in Revelation 14, there was another group, they were the overcomers, um, and there were two groups, that's what I taught. I wrongly taught that, so I'm publicly saying, uh, forgive me for teaching wrong. I was wrong in what I was saying there. Um, and I'm correcting what I was saying because it was wrong, it was inaccurate. And just to kind of give you my journey into how I have kind of understand the 144,000 is a couple years ago, uh, a friend of mine who I deeply respect and have a tremendous, tremendous respect for challenged me in my understanding of the 144,000 and basically was saying that these, these are not Jews, these are not Israelites, these are God's people. And at first I was like, there's no way, you're like, you're totally wrong about that. But I respected him greatly and I respected his ability to hear from God. And so I, I spent, I mean, this sounds kind of strange, but I spent a week in prayer asking the Lord, okay, God, <clears throat> It shows you I'm kind of a weird person, but a, a week, I mean, how many of you spent a week in prayer trying to understand 144,000? But that's just my passion. God put that in me. But anyway, I started like, okay, Lord, I just don't see this. I just don't see how this could not be literally Israel. I mean, it says it right there very clearly. And I'm going to explain now what, what, I believe, what I believe is a, a better interpretation I'm, and just came through uh, prayer um, and just waiting on the Lord. But I started to realize, okay, you know, there's actually some real problems with a literal interpretation of Revelation 7, 1 through 8. If you think about this, there are, there were when, uh, in 722, when Assyria invade, invaded Israel, 10 of the tribes were, were dispersed and assimilated into the Assyrian culture. And those 10 tribes are known as the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Those 10 lost tribes of Israel were, were integrated into the Assyrian culture, modern day Iraq. And so trying to figure out, okay, who are the 100, who are the 12 tribes of Israel? We know there's, you know, the, the tribe of Judah, that's the modern day Jewish uh, nation, the Jewish people. But okay, I started thinking about this, okay, are we really to expect that God's going to do like a heavenly ancestry.com search to figure out, okay, this person living in Iraq, he's actually from the tribe of Dan, okay, mark him, and uh, this person, you know, there's uh, these other theories that some of the, 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 the lost tribes are in India or in Pakistan or in Afghanistan, is God really like searching through those nations in India and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq and saying, okay, these ones, I know their, fa their fathers came from the tribe of Dan. I'm marking them. Are we really supposed to think that's what this is teaching? I, I, don't, think, I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. I, I think that what, what, is, what is happening here, I believe, what is happening here is that God is... Is, is using metaphorical language to convey a spiritual truth to us. He's using metaphorical language to convey a spiritual truth to us. There was another reason why I believe that to see the 144,000 is not being from the 12 tribes of Israel is in Revelation 14, 3 through 4, when God talks about the 144,000, he, he, he says very clearly they have been purchased from the earth, not from Israel, They've been purchased from among men. That, that's a general way to say they're purchased from among the nations, not just Israel. So th there's, there's clearly here uh, a conflict that made me kind of, you know, like that rule said, when the plain sense doesn't, when the plain sense makes sense, don't seek other sense. But when the plain sense doesn't make sense, then you need to say, okay, Lord, What's the, what's the, is there another way we should be reading this? Because after all, there is a lot of metaphors. There is a lot of prophetic uh, pictures and imagery that we don't just interpret it hyper-literal because then you get some, you'll get stuff that just make no sense. Okay. 
what I, after just spending a week trying to search this out, what I believe Revelation 7, 1 through 8 is talking about here, when he marks out the 144,000, is this is an allusion or a reference to the census that was taken in Numbers chapter 1. And I, I'm not going to read it right now. I want to encourage you to read Numbers chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 7. Read them together, and you, what you'll see, this is what I did. When I read it, I was like, oh, wow. It's the exact same language used. And what God was, what, what they were doing in, in Numbers chapter 1 is they were marking out the sons of Israel for war. And I was like, what, that's, that, that's exactly what's going on in Revelation chapter 7. Is he saying that these bond servants, he's using metaphorical language borrowed from the Old Testament to say these 144,000 are being marked out for war. They are the Lord's army in the day of his power. It's like, oh, what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 7 is not 144,000 Israelites, but the army in the day of God's power. Does that make sense? It's like, oh, wow. Well, like, I'll just give you one example, and you just can, can look it up for yourself. Numbers chapter 1, it's verse 20 and 21, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, I'm just going to quote, just say it real quick. You don't have to turn there. Now the sons of Reuben, every male from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war, was, they were numbered, their numbered men of the tribe of Reuben was 46,500. Then Revelation 7, verse 5 says, from the tribe of Reuben, there were 12,000. In other words, what God is using, he's using metaphorical language, an allusion to an Old Testament reference to say, these bond servants, these bond servants who are holy and they're sanctified, you can read about in Revelation 14, these bond servants are being marked out for war in the day of his power because they are the army of his power in the day of the Lord. Does that make sense? Now, when you start, when you come into that, when, when, when my eyes were open to that, I was like, goodness, the book of Revelation is very different now. Now, what we see in Revelation chapter 7, you have Revelation 7, you have Revelation 14, two whole chapters dedicated to the 144,000 and their role in the, in the end times. In other words, if you, if you see them not as 144,000 Israelites, but the army of the Lord, an apostolic prophetic army of the Lord in the day of God's power, preparing the bride for Jesus Christ, you begin to see, oh my goodness, this is, I've never seen this before in the book of Revelation. In fact, if you look at Revelation 7, the second part after those, oh, after those bond servants are set apart for war, after you see that, you see a, a multitude from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation and John was told they're coming up out of the great tribulation and they've made their robes white and they've washed them in the blood of the Lamb. That's not just talking about salvation. Now that does not just mean there is a, uh, an enormous harvest of lost people getting saved. I do believe it, in it does include that, but it's something even more, something but that's very important to us. This is the white robes in the book of Revelation are about the bride being made ready. Revelation 19, 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. To her it was given to her to clothe herself in white linen or, uh, white linen or fine linen, white and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. The white garments in Revelation 7 made white by the blood of the Lamb are the, they, they've come into full bridal readiness. They've come into full bridal readiness. You see what I'm saying here? It's this, this army of apostolic and prophetic witnesses. That's John the Baptist vessel that makes the bride ready in Revelation 7, and they come into full bridal readiness, and they make their robes white by the blood of the Lamb. Okay. So... The number 144,000 is also symbolic. I don't, believe, I don't believe the Lord is literally going, okay, 
what is this number for this army? Okay, it's going to be literally 143,999. Okay, well, Gabriel, we have one more. Okay, who's that person? Okay, boom, seal that person off. Now we're done. I believe it's just a symbolic number. The number 12 references the 12 tribes of Israel. The number 12 also references the uh, 12 apostles. So you got 12 times 12 times 1,000, which 1,000 is significant because that's the, the duration of the millennial kingdom when the Lord will reign. So I, I believe the Lord is just saying that this number are those who are going to have the authority of Christ in fullness. Okay, remember this. Remember this. In the day of his power, what also comes is also the day of his authority, the authority of Christ. Revelation 12.10 the authority of Christ has come. Apostolic apostles have the authority of Christ. They govern in the authority of Christ. And so the fact that this number is 144,000, is, is, I believe is basically saying God's apostolic government in fullness. What the actual number is, I don't know what it's going to be. But I believe what, what, what the Lord's saying here is it's the apostolic government of God in fullness at the end of the age. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I've got more. Um, I think it's important. If you're bored, <laughs> if not, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you get up and leave. I know, there will, I know there's for sure there's some people that want to hear this, um, but you're not going to hurt my feelings if you leave. <clears throat> okay, now I want to talk about the two witnesses. Okay, the two witnesses in Revelation 11, verses 3 through 12. These two witnesses are absolutely real people. They're absolutely real people. They're going to have a prophetic ministry for three and a half years, mainly centered in Jerusalem, but they're going to be, it talks about the whole world hates them. The whole world was tormented. How would you like that on your resume? The whole world's tormented by their prophetic ministry. I mean, and, and so a lot of scholars believe, and I, I personally believe, one of the witnesses is clearly Elijah, because Malachi says, Elijah's coming in the, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and also Jesus said in Matthew 17, Elijah's coming. So I, I definitely believe one of the witnesses is Elijah. You can look at it. He call, the, the witness calls for a drought. Elijah called for a drought. The witness, the witnesses call f, uh, fire is released from their mouth. Elijah released fire. So, I, I, you know, and Elijah never died. Elijah was raptured or caught up to God, and he never experienced death. So I, I definitely believe that one of the witnesses is Elijah, and possibly the other one could be Moses, but I don't know for sure because some of the plagues that are released by, by the, the, the two witnesses just definitely look like the plagues that were released by Moses to Pharaoh. But just basically you get this, this snapshot in Revelation 11, is they're entrusted with great authority. Is they have a prophetic ministry for 1,260 days. I mean, think about the end times. Like, that sounds weird. Think about this. How strange is it going to be when Elijah, the Tishbite, is literally in the flesh in Jerusalem ministering for three and a half years? I mean, strange. That's going to be so crazy. That's going to be so wild. And the nations are going to hate him. And they're going to rejoice for three and a half days when he dies because he's tormenting the earth with this prophetic ministry. They have the ability to kill those who try to kill them. They have, unpre they have unprecedented power to cause droughts, turn water into blood, and strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. Okay, that... What we see here, there are two literal witnesses in the, in, during the Great Tribulation who have a primary influence in Jerusalem. But what I want to show you now is the connection to the 144,000, the apostolic prophetic uh, army that God's raising up. Now look at what verse 4 says. Revelation 11:4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So these two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. In other words, 
What John is doing is he's looking back to Zechariah chapter 4, 1 through 14, when Joshua and uh, Zerubbabel were called the two olive trees. And do we have our slide presenter here? Okay, hopefully you can share the next slide here. That This visual will really, the, the lamp stands, the olive trees one, this visual will help you understand how, what this, this chapter was saying. Let me know when you see it. Okay. Someone maybe go get the uh, slide presenter to, oh, it's up. Okay, good. Okay. This visual really helped me understand. Okay, this is what, this is what Zechariah was seeing in Zechariah chapter 4. The two olive trees were Joshua and Zerubbabel. They were used as conduits of the Holy Spirit through which the Holy Spirit poured the oil into the lampstand, which was corporate, which was Israel back then. Okay? Does that make sense? It's pretty clear. So, in other words, God used Joshua and Zerubbabel as conduits of the Holy Spirit so the oil of the Holy Spirit could flow through them into the lampstand so that Israel could be a witness to the Gentiles after they came back from exile in Babylon. That was the, the gist of the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 4. But here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, John says that he, he references this prophecy. Now, just imagine, imagine here, those two olive trees are the two witnesses. And their, their anointing, their conduits of the Holy Spirit, filling a lampstand with oil. Okay, well, who is the lampstand? In Zechariah, they, Zechariah says... These two, Joshua and Zerubbabel, were two olive trees, but he never said they were a lampstand. But now in Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses are also a lampstand. What is a lampstand? It's a representation of the corporate. Does that make sense? The lampstand in Zechariah 4 represented Israel, the corporate people of God. The lampstand in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 is the seven lamps which represented the corporate, the seven churches. What I believe this is saying here is that the lampstand is representative of the corporate, the corporate witnesses. You see what I'm saying here? The corporate witnesses that are going to be part of this army in the day of the Lord. And so the, the anointing that flows through these two witnesses will flow into this 144,000 apostolic prophetic army of the Lord in the day of his power and they will be, these two witnesses will be training and equipping and empowering this army to equip the, the, uh, or to prepare the way for the Lord's second coming. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here. How this army will function. This army, this army, this 144,000, this army will prepare the bride of Christ and help her make her ready for him. We see that in Revelation 7, 9 through 17. This army will also lead many to repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ. This army will be apostolic. I say apostolic because of the number 144,000. I say apostolic because the authority of Christ has come. I say apostolic because these two witnesses have great authority and they're not, they're, these two witnesses are not just a, two literal witnesses. They are also a profile of the type of authority and power this full army will operate in. Not everyone will have that same kind of power. There will be rank within it. But these, these, this, it's an apostolic prophetic witnesses entrusted with the authority of Christ and given unprecedented power. This army will faithfully preach the eternal gospel. It's interesting in Revelation 14, 6, where it talks about the eternal gospel, it comes right after the mention of the 144,000. In other words, God is going to give this army of apostolic and prophetic witnesses the eternal gospel to preach, that message, and that message then is used to make the bride ready and to bring many to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, this army will be bond servants who follow the lamb wherever he goes and only do what the Lord is doing and saying. Again, this army is holy. This army is living in sexual purity, speaking the truth without manipulation or co coercion. They are going to be holy internally and externally. And all this is in the notes. 
This army is going to confront evil leaders and governments and regimes and systems and people like Moses and Elijah calling them to repent. Now this army, this is, this is what I believe, this is what I believe is going to happen. This army, you think of Elijah, let's just say it's Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses are leading this army. They're equipping these 144,000. These 144,000 are equipping the church. So now you have, like Ephesians 4 talks about, they're equipping the saints for the work of ministry. So now you have this, this entire army of, of the Lord, the, the, the church in leadership and divine order, equipping the church in her greatest hour of authority and power, uh, preparing the way for the Lord's return. I believe this will be an Elijah, John the Baptist army, anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah, who will prepare the way for the Lord's return, just like John the Baptist did. And like I've mentioned before, this army will initiate the reign of Jesus Christ on the earth with authority and power that has never been seen, uh, unlike anything we've ever seen. That's why it's like it, it's never been seen before. This has never been seen before. And so I know this is kind of out there, and it seems like, okay, how in the world could that ever happen? It almost seems like it's, are you sure that's right? Um, th this, how it, th here's my main point here, is this thing is not just going to happen magically and sovereignly. Now, the, the day of power, the day of authority, all that stuff is a work of God, absolutely. But what I'm saying is this army must be trained. This army must be equipped. It takes, it takes years of preparation, years of readiness, years to be made ready for this day. That's why I believe God, the Holy, the Lord is really emphasizing at this moment is time for the, for the John the Baptist vessel, the time for Elijah's army to rise up and, and get prepared for the day and the hour that we live in. This is not just going to be the book of Revelation and we're all sitting here as spectators watching these things unfold only by God's sovereign intervention. No, there is a role to play that the church has to be active participators and not just spectators. See, we so often have taken the book of Revelation and relegated it to scholars and theologians and Bible teachers thinking it has no real role to play when in fact we're living in the days of the end times and this book is, is absolutely imperative that we understand this book and participate as the army of the Lord for that day of power that is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but I do know it requires preparation. I do know it requires readiness. I do know it requires consecration. I do know it requires holiness and overcoming. And that, but I just say, if, if the church will do her part, if the church will make herself ready, God will use this army, lead, fivefold leaders, and also those who are not fivefold leaders, equipped as the army of God to make the bride ready at the end of the age. And the, listen, the greatest time of the greatest number of those who have come into bridal readiness, Revelation 7, is going to take place just before the Lord returns out of the great tribulation. When, the, when those from every nation, tongue, and tribe uh, come out of the great tribulation, they've made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the hour of history that we live in right now. And so I just want to end this by praying for us, just that God would really give us revelation of this. Give us revelation of this. And I realize this is new for you, so I would encourage you to, to do what I did. And even if you're like, I don't know if what he's saying is true. I don't know if what he's saying is really scriptural. That's fine. I get it. I, I would have a year or two ago thought what I was saying is nonsense. But as I really got into the scriptures and studied it and waited on the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, show me, show me, teach me, show me, explain these things to me. The Lord just began, I believe, to show me these things. So I want to encourage you, even if you think initially, I don't care, it's irrelevant, it has no practical value, or you're even saying, I don't believe what you're saying is accurate. I just want to challenge you. This is the challenge I want to give you as we end this message. I want to challenge you to take these notes, not just listen to the message, but take the notes and carefully read through the notes 
carefully pray about it. Go into the scriptures where, that I'm talking about because if what I'm saying is true, if what I'm saying is accurate, the church is completely, I mean, I mean only like less than 1% of the church, even le way less than 1% of the church is even talking about this. And if what I'm saying is true, if what I'm saying is at biblically accurate, then if 1% of the church is, is not even talking about this, and this is the, if I'm, what I'm saying is true, it's true, this is how the bride is made ready. This is how the Lord's return comes, comes about. Then the church is really missing it. We're totally missing out on what God is really trying to say. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to sound the alarm to us. This is very important. I know this was detailed. I know this was complicated in some sense. That's part of the reason why I didn't even want to share it because I know I've, I've, I'm used to people just zoning out going, what is he even talking about? But I just want to just challenge you. Please hear me. Please hear me. Please hear me. Get these notes. Read over these notes prayerfully. Okay, you don't have to agree with me, but you, I just want to challenge you to ask the Lord to say, okay, Lord, show me if this is right or show me if this is not right, okay? Show me the truth. And, and really, this is not something you do in one day. This, is, this takes some time. This has taken me some, uh, this has taken me a long season to really pray through and meditate on. But my burden is, if what I'm saying is true, if what I'm saying is true, the, the church is grossly negligent of what God must have in the earth for the Lord to return. And it, that's why I'm saying we've got, the only way this, the only way we can become what God's looking for us to be is if we have revelation. We have understanding. I just want to say, just to offer that challenge to you. This is the homework. This is the faith without works is dead challenge to you. Don't just go and hear this message and go, okay, boring. I don't get it. It's complicated. It's impractical. Get in the word and see, okay, be a Berean and see, okay, Lord, you teach me, Lord. You teach me. The Lord shows you something else. That's perfectly fine. I'm not saying you have to agree with what I'm saying. All I wanted to see is that we would go to the Lord and say, Lord, you show me. Because I've, I've had this feeling these things are of utmost importance, utmost importance to the unfolding of events in the days we live in. We have all these other signs taking place. And yet what is central to the unfolding of the book of Revelation is God's army, God's witnesses, God's apostles, God's prophets, his fivefold ministry army, equipping then the church to be the army that the church is meant to be in these last days to prepare the way for the Lord and his second coming. Because this army must come to, to, come to being. Come, or, or, or if this army doesn't come to be what it's meant to be by the power of the Holy Spirit, then, we, then the, we, the Lord will never get what he has. He, he's, got, he's got to have this army. Now I know there's a sovereign work to it. I know that. But there's also a divine responsibility to it as well that we must see our role to have understanding in these things. So my challenge is take these notes, take Psalms 110, uh, Revelation 7, Revelation 14, Numbers chapter 1, and really seek the Lord. Okay, Lord, you show me what you want me to see here so that I, my eyes can be open to what you're saying. Hey, and if the Lord tells you I'm wrong, please come tell me and I'll, you know, pray about it. So I definitely want to preach what is, what is biblically accurate. But I, that's my challenge to you. Just seek the Lord. Don't just write this off as being irrelevant and unnecessary. These are very, very important, very important that we understand these things. Okay, amen. So let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord for the time and the hour that we live in. Lord, we thank you for the time and the hour that we live in, Lord. We thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is giving us insight. Your Holy Spirit is giving us revelation. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to open the eyes of our hearts 
I'm asking you, Lord, to shine light into our hearts and to give us the understanding we need of the army in the day of your power so that we can see what you're wanting to do. Lord, I'm asking you to shine light so that we can see. I'm asking you for revelation to those who are hungry. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, even for those who, uh, Lord, you would just even stir in them a hunger to see from your word what I've talked about. And Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So God bless you online.